But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And when him. he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Good morning, church family. Thank you for joining us in person and those that are joining us online. It's our hope, those that are joining us online, that uh, you'll be able to gather with us next Sunday for Easter if you are able and nearby. Uh, if you live someplace else, find a local congregation that you can go and be a part of as well. For those that are unable to get out, we're thankful that we have this opportunity. As was mentioned before, this is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday kicks off Holy Week for us. It was on a Sunday that Jesus got on the back of a donkey and rode triumphantly into to Jerusalem. Along the way, there were people on the side who were shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that word Hosanna literally means God save us. And they would be expecting a salvation from uh, the empire of Rome, but Jesus had grander schemes in mind, and that would be salvation from hell, death, and the grave when he rose victoriously. And so uh, this kicks off that week. And then, of course, on Friday, we're going to gather once again here at 7 p.m. and we'll speak spend some time thinking about the cross and what Christ has done for us on that Friday when he passed away, next Sunday being Easter, and we'll celebrate his resurrection together. Now, uh, you can read about the, the triumphal entry in Luke chapter 19, uh, but we are in Luke chapter 6. We're in Luke chapter 6. And uh, I want to welcome the kids. The, the kids are joining us once again today. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, it's our joy and pleasure to be able to worship together as a generational, multi-generational family in the house of God. This gives kids an opportunity to watch moms and dads and grandparents worship the Lord and love him. Today, as we share, I'm going to talk about the disciples and, and even how some of these disciples died. And just so the parents know, uh, I'm going to do my best not to you know, describe every detail, but to kind of monitor that, but just realize uh, that that is a sensitive subject for your child. And so I just want you to be prepared for that. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, to tame that down just so that uh, we, we won't have any crying. All right, and I just hey, I want to mention this too. I recognize that today is heavy when you talk about people dying and you know, you know martyrdom. I, I realize that's heavy. So just know that that's the case, and uh, Lord willing, that won't be the case next week when when we get together. But I just I want you to be prepared, and I want your heart to be prepared. We need to talk about some of these things. In Luke chapter six, I won't be covering verses one through eleven. Hopefully, you've read there how the disciples were going through the wheat field and they were gathering grain and they were eating this on a Sabbath, and the Pharisees were upset. And then Jesus healed somebody on a Sabbath. Shame on him, right? And so now what we're going to look at today are these disciples. It's not a very long passage. It's just five verses, chapter six, verses 12 through 16. But it's packed with just powerful, uh, transformative work that God does in the lives of people and in this world. Because what we're going to look at are the disciples. Disciples are somebody who's a learner. A disciple is a learner, a student. And we're all students. Uh, hopefully, you're a student, a learner of Jesus Christ. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, you would be a disciple of this world and learning what the world is spitting out and trying to get you to understand and to walk in its ways. But a disciple of Jesus, these men were that. And then he calls them to be apostles. It's an office. It's authority that he gives to them. And these 12 guys turned the world upside down. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. In these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. And all night, he continued in prayer to God. So the appointing of the apostles that we're going to read about is not haphazard. Jesus didn't come down from the mountain and start drawing names out of a hat. He knew exactly who he was going to call. And verse 13, and when day came, he called his disciples. Now, this is all of his disciples. And that's a big crowd because there's a whole bunch of, following Jesus, a whole bunch of people following Jesus around because he's doing miracles. He has powerful teaching and everybody's interested. And so from this group, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named Apostles. Of these 12 apostles, and we're going to go through the list of names. Today's a bit of history, but it'll also be a bit of theology. Because some of these people, one of these people in particular, is Judas, Judas Iscariot, who would betray Jesus. 
And what we want to talk about is how, how could that happen? Why did that happen? Why would God allow that to happen? We'll talk about the theological implications of that toward the end of the message. But let's talk about these 12. He's going to list them. So in verse 14, we begin with Simon, Simon whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew. So when, when we get into the New Testament and we find these different names listed of the disciples, we always see Peter first. Peter's always listed first because he's seen as the leader of the apostles. It was Peter who preached the first sermon at Pentecost, and, and the church w- was born at that time. And so Peter is seen as the leader. Well, Peter continued to be an apostle and to lead until the 60s, until the 60s AD, when he was arrested by Nero there in, in Rome. Now, as we talk about these apostles and how they died, there's a whole lot of, you know, reports and legends, and sometimes we're not sure exactly what they did and how they died, but we try to gather all of the information that we can from reports at the time. So according to history, when he was uh, arrested, when Peter was arrested in Rome, he was taken to prison, he was tortured, and then taken to the Circus Maximus, where there he was crucified. And he wasn't crucified in the same way that Jesus was. Peter said, I'm not worthy to die in the same way that Jesus did on the cross. Crucify me upside down. And that's what happened to Peter. Now, as we go through the the list of apostles and we talk about how they died and what happened in their lives, I want to build off of something that Tyler shared last week that I thought was really impactful. And I want to build off of this point, that following Jesus will cost you everything. Following Jesus will cost you everything. And we see this with Peter. It cost him his life. We see this with the other disciples as well. Following Jesus means we no longer hang on to the things of this world. We're no longer hanging on to whatever might gain us just simply more money and worshiping money or worshiping popularity, worshiping comfort, or anything else that this world might throw at us. But we would worship Jesus Christ and him alone, that he would be Lord of our lives. We would no longer take center stage. Jesus Christ would. But that means you'll have to die to yourself and live fully to Jesus And for these men, it meant their lives. And for other Christians throughout history, it meant their lives. Following Jesus will cost you everything. Peter's brother, Andrew. Andrew was a disciple, first of all, of John the Baptist. And then he saw Jesus. And so he transferred his discipleship from John the Baptist to Jesus with John's blessings. And it was Andrew who invited his brother Peter to meet Jesus. Every time we kind of see Andrew in the Bible, he's always bringing people to Jesus, just like we talked about er- earlier in, in the service when Kristen was talking about, you know, inviting people to come to Easter, inviting people to meet Jesus. That's what Andrew was doing. And a lot of times we think, man, I've got to have all of the answers to Christianity. Uh, if I'm going to invite somebody to meet Jesus, you don't have to have all the answers. If somebody comes up and you say, hey, come meet Jesus, and they'll say, well, do you have all the answers? No, I don't have all the answers. Meet Jesus. He is the answer. You, you can ask him. So you don't have to know everything, but you do need to know Jesus and then have a heart to introduce those that you love to Jesus as well. That's what Andrew was doing. Well, Andrew was martyred in 70 AD. That's the same year that Jerusalem fell. And his crucifixion was on a cross as well. And tradition tells us that when Andrew saw the cross, he proclaimed, my whole life has been for the cross. Andrew wasn't nailed to that cross. He was tied to the cross. And he suffered a torturous death for three days on that cross before passing away. Following Jesus will cost you everything. The next person we have on the list is James. Notice James here. Now, among the 12 disciples, we have two James that are mentioned. We have James, the son of Alphaeus, known as James the Less. And then we have this James, the brother of John, who's known as James the Greater. Now, James and John, remember, they were the sons called the sons of Thunder, yeah, the sons of thunder. Sounds like professional wrestlers being introduced. Sons of thunder. And so sons of thunder, James and John, sons of Zebedee. And this James is known as the first apostolic martyr. Now, he's not the first martyr to die. The first martyr, do you remember the name of the first martyr? Stephen. So that's, James is the first apostle to be martyred. And he was martyred in 44 A.D. during a Jewish persecution led by Herod Antipas. Again, following Jesus will cost you everything. Now, his brother John. 
John was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's known as the disciple of love. Over and over in John's writing and scripture, he's reminding us we need to love one another. We need to love. He wrote five books of the Bible. Uh, he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote First, Second, and Third John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote the book of Revelation when he was exiled in Patmos. There's a legend that says that John, at one point, was boiled in oil uh, but did not die and was later then exiled and, and put on the, the island of Patmos. And there, while he's on Patmos, that's when he gets the revelation from God and he writes it down and we have it in Scripture. John is the, the oldest living of the disciples, it still costs him everything to follow Jesus, but he lived the longest, and he's the only one that died a natural death. They believe that he was released eventually from Patmos, went back to Ephesus, and died around 100 AD, and that's when he passed away. Then we've got next in line, Philip. Philip, the New Testament doesn't tell us a lot about Philip. We're told Philip is the one who went to Nathaniel. Nathaniel's also called Bartholomew. And Philip said to Nathaniel, hey, I, we, we met the Christ. We have found the one that Moses and the prophets have spoken of. Then later we see Philip again. Again, we don't see a whole lot of him, but we see him at the feeding of the 5,000. And it was Philip who calculated how much it would cost then to feed that many people. We're told that Philip, he became a missionary and he went to other nations after Jesus' resurrection and, and he uh, went to France, and he also went to modern-day Turkey, where he was martyred in the year 54 AD. Uh, he, he died. They, they stoned him, but he didn't die by stoning. They then took him and crucified him. Following Jesus will cost you everything. Nathaniel, or Bartholomew, as the ESV has his name, he's known by both. When Jesus first not, saw Nathaniel uh, approaching Jesus said, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So we don't know a lot about Nathaniel, but we can see he's not a person of deception or manipulation, and Jesus says this about him. And so Nathaniel says to Jesus, how, how, how would you know that about me? And Jesus says, look, before you came over, I saw you under the fig tree. In other words, I've seen you your whole life. I know you. And that's, that's when he said, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Nathaniel made that profession even before Peter did. From tradition, we're told that Nathaniel, he too became a missionary. He started the first Christian church in Armenia. And while he was there in Armenia, he caused quite an uproar, especially with the pagan priests that were there. Because among other things, he was preaching about the sanctity of life and marriage. Which is interesting that today, if you talk about the sanctity of life and marriage, you're considered hateful. It's considered hateful to say, don't murder your babies in your womb. That's sin. But thank God that there's a gospel that offers you forgiveness. That's good news. You're considered hateful if you would say that homosexuality is a sin and homosexuals can't be married. And once again, the gospel is given to people who are homosexual so that they might repent and follow Jesus Christ and walk in newness of life. However, you're not allowed to say those kinds of things because the pagans of this world would say, you can't do that. So there's nothing new under the sun. And so what they did with Nathaniel, they took him in AD 70 and they tore his skin off and then crucified him. Following Jesus will cost you everything. So far, we have seen Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, verse 15, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot. So we have Matthew, or Levi. Tyler talked about him last week and the calling of Levi. Levi, Matthew, was a tax collector, so he's Jewish, but he's working for Rome and collecting taxes from his people. And then Jesus calls him to follow him, and that's the point at which we read that Matthew, leaving everything, followed Jesus. Following Jesus will cost you everything. It cost Matthew his job, not to bend his knee any longer to an empire, but to bend his knee to Jesus Christ. And so filled with joy was he that his life is being transformed by his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he throws this big party for all of the other tax collectors and his sinner friends and all the Pharisees who want nothing to do with Jesus and they don't want to repent of their sin. They're all upset about that kind of thing. 
Now, Matthew, we find him writing an entire gospel in the Bible. He writes one of the gospels. And in Matthew's gospel, we have the most Old Testament references because he's writing to a Jewish audience. So obviously, Matthew didn't agree with Andy Stanley, who says we should unhitch from the gospel. No, or from the Old Testament. We need to hold on to the Old Testament so that we know the complete picture of what God has done in creation and sending his son through his people Israel. We need the Old Testament. So Matthew, he became a missionary. According to tradition, he's the first to go to Africa. He went to Ethiopia, and he started a church there. So while he is there, he too got in problems with the local pagan priests, and Matthew was beheaded in 60 AD. Following Jesus will cost you everything. Now, when I say that kind of thing, I'm not saying that you're going to die a martyr's death, but I'm not saying that you're not going to. We don't, we don't know. And we look at these disciples, and we might say, well, what's the matter with them? Why, why are they dying like this? Don't, don't they know they're the head and not the tail? And they should be walking in victory? They have the spirit like we have the spirit. They have the same promises that we have. What was going on? They refused to bow their knee to Caesar, who would say that Caesar is Lord. And they decided, Caesar isn't Lord. We've met the Lord. He died on the cross for our sins, and he rose from the dead. And Jesus is king. And in fact, Jesus is king over Caesar. And it may be, I have no idea. There may be a time in our lifetime where we will need to decide, will we stand or will we kneel? Will we kneel before a a government or some other religion that would say, renounce Jesus Christ and live, receive Christ and die? In that moment, you and I would have a choice to make. Will I kneel before others or will I kneel only to Jesus Christ and stand in the face of tyranny and proclaim Jesus is my king? It's happened for centuries. Happened with the first guys. It happened in the centuries that followed. You and I have been living in a nice little bubble. Will your faith cost you? It will cost us everything if we are true followers of Jesus. Thomas, I told you today was heavy. Thomas, Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas. He's also called Didymus, that means twin. Thomas is one of the disciples where uh, he he had told Jesus, Jesus, I'm gonna follow you to the bitter end. I'm, I'm I'm not gonna back away. I will be here and I'll follow you all the way to death. He was one of those that said that. And then when he sees that Jesus died on the cross, he's he's just crushed. And he couldn't even believe his friends after they had seen Jesus, after he rose from the dead and he appears to the other disciples and they said, Thomas, no, he's he's alive. We've seen him in the flesh. He, He lives. And Thomas, who has just hit the wall with his faith, says, unless I put my finger in his wounds, I will not believe. But then Jesus, in his love for Thomas, he shows up again, and Thomas is in the room, and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And in that moment, Thomas is worshiping Jesus as God, and Jesus is receiving that worship because Jesus is God. He is the living one, and Thomas is devoted fully to him. And then Thomas takes this good news of what his eyes have seen And he carries that good news all the way to India. We have some Indian friends in the room with us today. Thomas was a missionary to India, and he was martyred in 70 AD by being killed with a spear. Following Jesus will cost you everything. And as we think about all of these apostles and them dying, you have to realize that people don't die for a known lie. If they're making these stories up, these men would not die this way for something they know is a lie. People will only die for what they believe. And these men are dying for the belief of what they have seen and what they have heard. And so next week as we talk about Easter and we're looking at Jesus rising from the dead, even as the world might say, no, Jesus just swooned on the cross. He just passed out. He wasn't really dead. He didn't really come back. They stole his body. Baloney. They would not be going through these things. If it were a lie, they'd been transformed. 
and they realized that following Jesus would cost them everything. The next person we have is James, the son of Alphaeus. James, also known as James the Less. He, would call, he was called James the Less either because the other James uh, was either taller or older. So he, this guy is either young or short. Maybe both. I don't, I don't know. So uh, here tradition tells us that James, he was a missionary to Syria, and around 63 AD, he was brought back from Syria. They took him back, the religious leaders took him back, called him a heretic, took him up to the top of the temple, and they threw him off. But the fall did not kill him. It just simply broke his leg, and then the executioners came and hit him in the head with a large rock and killed him. Following Jesus will cost you everything. Simon. Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were all about overthrowing the, the Roman Empire. And then uh, it's interesting here that you have one of the apostles who are, is opposed to Rome, and then you have Matthew who's working for Rome, and they're both in the same group. You think that you've got conflict at your office. There is a bit of conflict here, but Jesus gets them to, to work together. So tradition tells us that Simon, he became a missionary. He took that, that zealous zeal for Christ and he carries this good news and he goes to North Africa and he goes to Spain and he goes to Britain where in the year 74 AD he was sawn in half. Following Jesus will cost you everything. Peter, James, Peter Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the Lesser, Simon the Zealot, verse 16, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So first, we got Judas, the son of James. He's also known as Thaddeus, and I'm sure he went by that a whole lot more often uh, than Judas. I'd change my name too. If my name were Judas, we can thank our parents. Thank you for not naming me Judas. So here, here we have Thaddeus, and we, we know very little about him, except through tradition, he, mar he was martyred as well in the year 70 AD. He was either beaten or stoned or crucified, we're not sure. One thing we are sure of, following Jesus will cost you everything. So now we've got another Judas. So we have the two Judases. I don't know how, what the plural of Judas is. Judas Iscariot. Now Judas Iscariot, he's the guy that we identify with betrayal. And the experts regarding his name and what Iscariot means, they're, they're divided. Some believe that Iscariot is about a region to the south. Others would say that the word Iscariot comes from the word dagger that certain assassins would use. Either way, we know that Judas was a traitor to Jesus. Not only was he a traitor, we know he's a thief. We know he's a thief because of what happened in John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, what we find is Mary anointing Jesus' feet in Bethany. And as she's anointing his feet, the ointment that she used was very, very expensive. And that's when Judas Iscariot says, what a waste. Why, why wouldn't you take that ointment and sell it and give the money to the poor? And John writes this in John 12, verse 6. It says, Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he helped himself to what was put in. So he's stealing the offering. He's a traitor. He's a thief, and he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He had told the soldiers, I'll lead you to Jesus. I'll hand him over. He's in the garden. Follow me. You'll recognize that it's Jesus because he's the one that I'll kiss. And so Judas, he goes to the garden of Gethsemane, approaches Jesus, and Jesus says, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? After Jesus is arrested, Judas felt such guilt and shame that he committed suicide. Not following Jesus will cost you even more for the rest of eternity. So we gotta decide. Do we follow Jesus or do we follow our own way? Will we follow the world? Will we betray the one who loved us so much he went to the cross in our place? This betrayal by Judas, not an accident. This was planned before the foundation of the world. 
And I say this because of John chapter 13. I don't have time to read it right now. John 13, verses 18 and following. This was something. And, and Jesus said, I'm telling you this now just so that you know this has already been planned. Which leads us to a theological question that I'd like to pose to you today, looking at Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. Why would God ordain someone to betray Jesus? What, what would you say to somebody? They walk up to you and they say, why would God even create Judas to betray Jesus? And then let me ask you this. How can you hold that person accountable for their actions? I mean, Judas gets to the judgment and he just simply says, it's not my fault. This is your fault, God. You made me do this. Pretty tough question. How would you answer that? Well, this isn't the first time that we see people who are wicked and God using them in such a way to carry out his plans. We see it clearly over and over in scripture, especially go to the Old Testament. I think quickly of Joseph. Remember Joseph and his brothers tossing him into a pit? That was a wicked thing to do. He sold into slavery, but eventually it led to this place where God used what was wicked in order to free his people. Another place that we see it clearly is with Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? He had all the Israelites and they're in bondage there in Egypt. And God raises up Moses to go to Pharaoh. And Moses says to Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. And every time, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 9, verse 12 says this, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, fortunately, we're told the purpose, and the purpose is found in Romans chapter 9. It tells us there that God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that people would know that it was God who saw the Israelites free. It was not Moses and his great speaking, and it sure wasn't the benevolence of Pharaoh. It was the love of an almighty God using wickedness to work his plan. Judas is wicked. Pharaoh is wicked. Now, this whole thing goes to and strikes at the core of your theology. And you have a theology. You have an idea about who God is and the way that he operates in this world. And if you begin with the idea that people are basically good, they might do some bad things, but at their core, people are basically good. If you believe that, then you are going to have a very, very difficult time justifying and coming to terms with man's actions and God's judgments. But if you believe, as God's word says, that mankind is wicked and sinful and separated from God, then you begin to view the forgiveness and love and mercy and grace of God as a miraculous gift, an amazing thing that God would ever forgive anyone and offer them salvation and love them when you understand that man is not good. We are bad. We are sinful. And I say this, I know it pushes against because the majority of Christians would say, no, 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 no. People are basically good. No. Romans chapter, now if you believe the Bible, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, no one is righteous. You're righteous on your own? You, you, have, you like lived perfectly. I haven't lived perfectly. None of us have. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. No one's seeking for God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Nobody's coming to Jesus on their own. Nobody's coming like, I'm really good and I'm going to force my way into this heaven. Nobody comes to him because there is nothing good on the inside of us. We are wicked and separated from God. It is God himself that begins to take a hard, wicked heart and begin to draw it to himself. This is over and over in scripture. John 6, verse 44, Jesus says this. No one, who? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
What is going on? God takes a hard heart, a traitor, a rebel, somebody who is opposed to God, who has no desire to repent of sin, who wants to set themselves on the throne of their life and say, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I don't need God. And he begins to take that heart and whisper into that heart his great love, which should blow our mind. That God would do that. I know what I've done. This is God drawing a wicked heart. We're not good. Judas is not good. Pharaoh is not good. One of the things that God does for people is sometimes he just lets them go ahead and have their own wicked way. Just let that heart that is inclined to sin just keep on doing that thing. But here's the great thing. One of the ways that God exercises his common mercy is by restraining people's wickedness. That's amazing. He keeps us from living out the depths of the sinful inclinations in your heart. Haven't you had some thoughts that you're just like, oh, that is, that's rancid. That is a wicked heart. The late R.C. Sproul has said this. He says, we are as bad off as we can be, but we're not as bad as we can be. We're as bad off as we can be because we are separated from God. We, we have sinned against a holy God. We are not holy. He is holy. He is pure. We are not. We are separated, sinful, heading to hell apart from the grace of God. We're as bad off as we can be, but we're not as bad as we can be. There is a restraining act of God upon the hearts of men. And we, we see this. If, if God were to allow the wickedness of mankind just to churn and be fully released upon, upon this planet, this world right now, it would be hell on earth. And I think we've seen some of that, haven't we? Haven't we seen this on the news? You're like, how, how, how are people that wicked? How would they do that to one another? This is brutal. This is offensive. This is disgusting. How is this possible? It is the human heart. And the restraint of God being lifted in that moment, and we are seeing full picture, nonstop, what happens with someone who's given over to themselves? The restraint of God upon a wicked heart is an amazing thing. Let me give you an example of what this is like. We've all seen it. We all understand this. Like if you were to just talk about the, the most wicked, don't, don't say it out loud, like the most sinful people you know, the worst people, I'll say them. One, one person my mind goes to is Nero. We've been talking about Christians being persecuted. Nero would take Christians, they, he would impale them alive and then set them on fire so he could see in his garden. Hitler would be top on our list. Hitler, a Nazi, responsible for 17 million deaths. You'd have to add to the bad list, Stalin, a Marxist, 20 million deaths. And do not forget Mao Zedong, Communist Chinese Party, 45 million dead. What do all these men have in common? Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong. What do they have in common? There was no one there to hold them accountable. There was nobody there to keep them in check. They had full reign to do whatever their heart wanted to do. All God had to do was lift that common mercy of restraint off the heart of Hitler and let Hitler Hitler, because that's who he is. And friends, that's the heart of man. That is a heart that is separated from God. Same with Judas, same with Pharaoh. Martin Luther put it this way, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, he didn't have to create fresh evil in Pharaoh's heart. There was plenty of evil already there. His heart was hardened by the lifting of the restraint of God. The amazing thing is that God works through wicked people. And again, it's not as if Pharaoh or Judas were innocent. They were wicked. That already existed in their heart. All the finger pointing of evil must be directed to those who are evil and not to the one alone who is good. Only God is good. What happened with Judas is an unregenerate, treacherous crook had the restraint of God lifted. But through that corruption, 
God worked and brought about the greatest work of salvation in human history. God meant for good when his son, Jesus Christ, was then betrayed, went to a cross, and died on the cross for your wickedness and for my wickedness. But if left to ourselves, every single one of us would betray Jesus. All of us. If it weren't for the grace of God who redeems us. If there's anything on the inside of you where where you feel your heart just warmed to this God, wanting and longing to be loved by him and to give your love and worship to him, friend, that is him causing your heart to be softened. To take a heart of stone and to make it a heart of flesh to extend to you his mercy and his grace. And every single repentant sinner that comes to him, God will not reject. He will receive. He will cleanse you. He will wash you. He will take that heart and soften it and give you a new heart, make you a new creation, and you will belong to him. But understand this, following Jesus Christ will cost you It is not just simply a a prayer, a sinner's prayer, and now I'm in. It's not just simply, I came to the altar. No, I have turned over my life. Jesus is now my life. He is my Lord. He is my Savior, and I serve him alone. Following Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, it will cost you everything. Not following Jesus will cost you even more for the rest of eternity. If you hear that, your ears have been opened. Your eyes have been opened to the good news. Your heart is ready to receive by coming before Jesus and admitting what you already know. You are a sinner in need of a savior. And Jesus is that savior. And it is amazing that he would wash us and cleanse us, and give us a new heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mercy, for your restraining work in this world. We recognize sin all around us, and in fact, we recognize sin in our own lives. We could try to hide from that kind of thing, but we cannot run from you. You know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our lives. And yet, You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross and then to rise again. Father, I pray for each person here that they would receive that good news, that they wouldn't harden their heart, but today when they hear this good news, that they can have a relationship with you, that they would bend their knee, that they would admit, I am a sinner, and you, and you alone are my Savior. Thank you for giving me a new heart. Live your life through me. I give myself fully to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Again, we're gonna gather on Friday. We're gonna talk about uh, the Good Friday service, uh, the cross. We're gonna come on Saturday, or Sunday rather, and we're gonna celebrate a victorious risen Lord. And it won't be that heavy on Easter. All right, God bless you all. There'll be people down here to pray with you. Lord bless you.